Welcome to the Time Has Come podcast. My name is Graham Wardle, and this is my second solo cast. A solo cast episode is just with me, and I'm going to be answering some of your questions and sharing with you a bit about what is going on in my life now that I have moved on from Heartland, which I've been a part of for 14 years, and I'm so grateful for that chapter of my life. I'm now moving on to new things. And so I talk a bit about that, what's on the horizon for me. And I share also about the importance of finding a vision, tuning into a divine plan or God's plan, how to surrender to what life brings us, and also about standing up for what you believe in, no matter what it is, coming from your heart and speaking your truth. So the time has come for us to start this solo cast. What's going on, everybody? Thank you so much for joining me on another solo cast. So I'm doing another one here. I thought it was time to just reconnect with you guys and share a bit about what's going on in my life because (laughs) things are changing, hey? The world is um, a brand new place. And uh, like I've said before, I don't feel we're ever going back. Uh, This is a new a new chapter for everybody in the world. And there's, you know, thinking that once we get those jabs that we will be able to go back to the way life was. But uh, my gut tells me that that's not going to happen. It will be a a constant, ever-changing landscape. And so we need to learn how to create a vision in a world that we want to live in. And I think that's really important, whether or not you agree or disagree with what's going on in the world, I think having a vision and directing your life towards that vision of a world you want to see and a life that you want to create is important. And if you don't do that consciously, someone else will do it for you. So that's something that I've been thinking a lot about because uh, recently I read a book called The Miracle Morning, which was actually suggested to me by somebody on Instagram. They just sent me a message and they said, hey, like, I think you would like this book. And I was kind of like, I I read it. And I was like, this is great. I I actually really like this. Like, thank you so much. So for everybody sending me messages on Instagram, I do try and read them all. And I really appreciate it. So this book is called The Miracle Morning. And it's by Hal Elrod. It's just about getting up early. (laughs) Like, There's a few books out there that talk about getting up early, the power of getting up early. And, you know, I've had friends that have recommended it to me. And I'm like, yeah, cool. Uh, I'm cool with like, just, you know, doing my own thing. I don't really want to wake up any earlier than I have to. And that made this book so much more powerful for me. So maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe someone out there is listening and saying like, yeah, I'm not really into getting up early. I get up early enough. But what I found interesting for myself was getting up early has always been because I had to. When I was a kid, I would just, as soon as my eyes popped, I was up and I was ready to go. But as I got older, it was like... (laughs) It was like trying to spend as much time as I could in my bed before I had to go. And so what I found so interesting about this book was that I was consciously choosing to get up early, like 6 a.m. or 5 a.m., and spend the first hour of my day investing in myself. And so that did something to me psychologically or, or internally where you're not getting up because you have to. You're getting up because you're choosing to invest in yourself. So therefore, you're worth investing in. And so it's a conscious daily practice of telling yourself, I'm worthy. I'm worthy to invest in. I value myself. I love myself. And I'm going to get up early and get myself oriented, take some time in silence, take some time for meditation, take some time for prayer, and then do these different practices that he recommends in the book that are really helpful at orienting yourself and aligning yourself with a vision of the future and a life that you want to live. And so I was like, this is great. And I want to share this on my podcast because I've got a lot of benefit out of envisioning my life and creating it and being specific about it and then feeling those feelings as if I was living that life. And Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about that in a lot of his work as well. And they're all great. There's so many people that have talked about this. Sometimes things happen and you're not ready for them. And then they come again and you're like, I'm ready for it. And I can digest it again and get a new meaning from it. And so maybe this is that moment for some people that are like, yeah, yeah, I've heard of visioning. I've tried it. It's, it's like, doesn't work for me or eh, whatever. It's, you know, not really my thing. Maybe this is a time to try it again. Maybe this is a time to try and refocus and, 
and try this practice in your life again, because that's what it's been like for me. I've, I've tried this many times and it's worked and then I've kind of fallen off and then, you know, it's kind of gone by the wayside, but now incorporating it into my morning ritual or my morning routine of silence and meditation and, and envisioning, it's been really helpful. And like I've said before, with the world changing, with things happening so quickly around us, I think it's very important that we consciously create our lives the way we want them to be. And we set an intention because if we don't do those things, it can be, I, can, I believe it can be dangerous. You kind of get lost in being pushed around by other narratives, other strong stories or suggestions for your life. And then you start living a life that's not really what you want, but you're living it because you didn't consciously choose and you kind of get swept away <laughs> into the stream of, of other things. So uh, I think it's really important to do that. And especially with all the changes that are going on in the world right now, there's a lot of suggestions of the way our lives are going to be normal. There's this idea of a new normal and we just have to accept these things as the way it's going to be. And I'm very, very concerned about that. I'm not going to participate in a, in a new normal that is dictated to me. I want to create that with other people consciously. I want to create a world where we are loved and respected and strong and healthy and we respect each other's freedoms and rights as well. I think that's probably the foundation, the fundamental aspects of our lives that are so important that we uphold and we keep intact. That's a vision that I have is that we re-strengthen, we reconnect to these fundamental principles that have lasted for so long in our society that are important. And before everything that's gone on, I haven't been interested really in, you know, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms or the, the Canadian Human Rights Act. Like that was something that I knew existed, but I had never read it. I didn't know where to find it. But now I'm, I'm <laughs> I carry a copy with me in my car. I carry it. I, it's, it's something that I have read and I've learned about. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so interesting and so useful and so valuable. And there's a reason that it was created this way. This is a part of my vision. This is a part of my understanding and my journey that I wanted to share with you guys because it's really important that we craft our lives, that we shape our lives. We appreciate our lives for where we are right now and we envision our lives the way we want them to be and we point ourselves towards that and we focus on that consciously. And put our energy into that. So that's visioning. And that's something that if you want to read The Miracle Morning or there's many other books about this, but it's just a topic that I wanted to share with you guys that I thought was, was really important. This is another topic that I wanted to share with you guys is standing up for what you believe in. This is kind of, you've heard it all before. I've heard that before. Oh yeah, you got to stand up for what you believe in, you know, like it's great. I've heard that. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Of course. But what's interesting is in the back of my mind, it was like, eh, as long as it doesn't make me too uncomfortable, eh, as long as I can maintain or I don't have to risk anything. As a lot of you probably know, I have uh, spoken up about my disagreement with some of the policies that our politicians and uh, the people in, in our governments have been implementing in our society because of the adverse effects that they are having on our society. And um, those adverse effects, suicides and drug overdoses and, and, and alike aren't being really considered and taken into an account when these policies are being introduced. And so that's something that I'm standing up for and, and talking about and trying to raise the alarm or, or you know, wave the flag and say, hey guys, we got to pay attention to this. And that hasn't been easy because when you speak up against a mainstream narrative or the sort of collective story that's going around, people get upset. And I think it's important, whether you agree with me or not, I don't want you to agree with me. What I want to encourage people to do is to stand up for what they believe in and not be afraid to do so because of pushback, because of name calling or judgments that come from other people. I had a conversation with a woman the other day about this and I said, look, I don't want you to agree with me. If you believe what you're doing is right with your policy in your store, I want you to fight for that. I think it's important that people stand up and fight for what they believe in. I, I don't think just because it's legal or because the government told me to do it, that that's the right thing to do. It's a very interesting issue. And I've really sort of looked into this and gone like, man, this is like, this is tough. This is not easy because 
ultimately, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I, I love people and I love giving back and contributing to this world. And I just want people to get along. But there comes a point where if you don't speak up, if you don't say something, then there is an encroachment. There is a, a breach of a boundary or of, of your rights or of the safety of, of individuals that are being overlooked. And so a lot of those, those statistics and, and stories of un, unfortunate side effects of these policies are, are being revealed. And that's, that's something that's important to me and that's, that's something that I'm speaking out against. And I want to raise that flag. And it's not easy, but I think it's important. And at the end of the day, I always ask myself, you know, if I was going to look back at my life in, in, you know, 20, 30 years, would I be proud of myself in this moment? Or would I say, oh, man, I shouldn't have spoken out. I should have just done what I was told and, and gone along with it. And, and um, I should have been a lot more afraid of the situation. I should have had a lot more fear around this. Personally, I don't think I will ever look back at my life and wish that I had more fear or wish that I didn't speak up. I can't see how that would be possible. I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm just saying that I think it's important for people to speak up for what matters to them in their heart. Because it's very easy to speak up and say things that uh, you've, someone, you've heard somebody else say. And it's a, a story or a narrative or a perspective that you're like, yeah, I'm just going to say this. <laughs> I'm just going to say what I saw these people on TV say. I think that's kind of dangerous. You got to be careful around that. I think it's important to listen to all sides, but then you got you to tune into yourself. Does this make sense? How does this feel in my heart? Am I coming from a place of love or from a place of fear? How does this, how does this feel? Because throughout history, society has never made successful progression forward when they're coming from a place of fear. It's always when they come from a place of love. And we have history to look back on and go, you know, all those times that people have stood up and spoke their truth and came from a place of love, we've made significant strides. So I think that's important. And I want healthy debate. I think it's very important that we have conversations. I, I don't agree with the censorship of, of speech. I think if somebody presents an idea that's false or it needs to be more nuanced, then we should be able to, to talk that out. We should be able to debate and have those conversations. That's very healthy in my mind, as opposed to if somebody says something that we don't like or makes us feel uncomfortable, and we say, well, we should just quiet them and shut them down. That doesn't really, <laughs> doesn't really solve anything. I, I think it's, it's not the best way to move forward because at what point do you just silence anyone? who you don't like or you don't agree with. That's a dangerous world, and I don't want to live in that world. <laughs> I would rather have healthy debate with people. But in general, I think having freedom of speech and having good, open, and honest debate is important. So I wanted to share that with you guys because that's something that's very relevant right now, and it's something that I'm thinking about a lot. That's why I started a Telegram channel because I wanted to share more information and stuff, and I know different social media accounts are very concerned about what is said on their on their platforms and they are throttling banning censoring different um, perspectives and opinions which i don't think is is wise so anyways i'm kind of diversifying myself so that there is a bit more room for conversation on topics i also want to talk about this idea well i call it like a divine plan or probably more commonly referred to as god's plan and I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of my life and what's next and how to direct and orient myself. And so often for myself, I don't know about you guys, but for myself, I get into like, oh, what's going to happen here? And I try to plan too much. Or I try to figure out things too far in advance. What I have continually <laughs> come to remember is the importance of just focusing on what's in front of you right now and doing the best that you can. It was Dale Carnegie who wrote a book called how to Stop Worrying and Start Living. I read that book a couple of years ago and, and he effectively lays this out in that book about you don't build a wall all at once. You build a wall by placing this one brick as best you can today. That's something that, is, is, that I think about a lot and I try to remind myself of so that I can just go, hey, this is what I'm doing today. And I'm going to do my best to plan and to orient myself to a vision of the future that I like and then I'm inspired by, and then I'm connected to. 
but I'm going to focus on today. And I'm going to spend my energy and attention right here, right now. And with God's plan, this idea of the divine plan, very often <laughs> something will happen. Life will change. And I'll be like, this isn't a part of my vision. This isn't a part of my plan. This isn't what I wanted. Like, why is this happening? <laughs> and then it's only afterwards that you take a step back and you're like, oh, that's why it happened. That was really tough, but I needed that. And 2020 has, has been that for me. It's like, everything is changing. We can't shake hands. We can't hug. We can't smile because we can't see anybody's faces. Like what, what's going on? Like, and it was really frustrating. I really had to kind of take a step back and be like, why is this a part of the plan? Like, what is it that I can learn from this? Because I'm being, I'm being taught something. There's something here for me to learn. That's the, that's always the perspective I come with because I'm like, it's beneficial to me. I can choose the meaning that I want to get from something. And so I choose to look for the silver lining. I choose to look for what I can grow, how I can grow from this and then share this with others. Because that feels great. So I, that's the one I choose. So with everything that's going on, this happened and I didn't plan for it. It was, it was upsetting. And I was like, man, I just want to go to sleep, wake up and it'll be over. Or, okay, I'll do the two weeks and then it'll be over. Or, okay, I'll do a couple months and then it'll be over. Okay, fine. You know, this mask thing, then the, the jab thing, and then it's the next thing. And the goalposts keep moving. And I'm kind of like, this isn't going to be over. <laughs> this is trying to teach me something. And this is my narrative. This is my story. I'm not saying this is true for, for everybody. But for me, I kind of take a step back and said, this isn't over until I learn what I need to learn. And who I've become in this process and how I've, you know, now studied the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Human Rights Act and all these different provincial health orders and the, the mandates that are coming down. I'm learning so much about how our system of government works. You know, how laws and mandates and health orders and the, the, the level of significance that they have and what supersedes what. You know, these are all things that I didn't know before. This is a silver lining. This is something that is empowering to me once I learn it. That... I, I otherwise would never have gotten. And I'm so glad that I took the time to invest in these things and to learn about these things because it's so important. And so when it comes to a divine plan or God's plan, I always have to remind myself that when I'm creating a vision, when I'm directing myself in a certain way, that I always have to surrender to a bigger plan. Whether you're religious or not, like there's always a, there's a bigger plan. There's things that happen in life that you can't explain that, that you didn't see coming. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a vision. You shouldn't have a direction that you're going. But that when those things happen, when, when God steps in or the divine steps in and says, we're going <laughs> to, this is the event that you're going to go through. This is the, the situation that you're going to be exposed to. How do you surrender to that? And what do you make it mean? Asking questions is, is, and what questions you ask, I think is so important. I've talked about this before in my last solo cast, Warren Berger's uh, More Beautiful Question book. I, I can't recommend that book enough to people. Just learning how, what questions you ask will determine the quality of the answer. So if you ask a good quality question, you're going to get a good quality answer. But so often we ask the first question that comes to our mind, and that's not always the best one. So having the patience and the sort of time to just go, is this the best question that I'm asking right now? Maybe I can think of this a new way. So that's what I wanted to share about this idea of, of God's plan or divine plan and how that kind of fits in with visioning and how very often in life, or I should say always in life, there is a bigger plan and how to hold a vision while staying open and surrendering to what comes so that you can make the most of it and learn something because you can't know, <laughs> you can't know what's coming for you. There are blessings and rewards and treasures and things that are beautiful that are coming that you don't even know to ask for, that you don't even know is possible for your life. So it's, it's like so beneficial to have a vision, to orient yourself towards that vision, but then to remain open because you're going to get surprises that you never saw coming and to make the most of those. The next thing I wanted to talk about was this concept of being the light. Uh, I was talking with a friend the other day and she was expressing to me how she was going around doing her part and, and uh, trying to help out in her community and standing up for what she believed in and, you know, getting pushback from people and stuff. She said, well, what I do is I think to myself, I am the light. I'm going to be the light. I'm going to be that love. And I'm here to help. 
And I've had some questions from people saying, you know, how do you deal with negative feedback or comments or, or, or negativity from your decisions or, or what's going on? And um, this is something that I was like, yeah, that's, that's the best way I can think of it. Is you be the light. You stand in your truth. You stand in your heart. And you come from that place of love. And if people really have something to say and they really want to connect with you and they really want to have a, a respectful conversation or they want to dialogue, they're going to be coming from that place too. And if they're not, wish them well and, and move on because everybody's got their own journey. Everybody's on their own path. It's not up to me or to anybody else to change them. That's what they want to experience and that's what they're going through. So I think that's important to allow people their space and it's not my place to, to, to try and change them. But it's also not my responsibility to take it from them if they're being negative or, or <laughs> jumping on my case. It's like, that's cool, but I don't have to listen to it. Like there's no rule in the rule book that says I got to stand here and uh, be a part of this. So reminding yourself that when you're standing in truth and when you're standing up for what you believe in and you're coming from a place of, of love and light in your heart, that that was what protects you, that that is what gives you that confidence to stay grounded and to speak up. And also to risk losing, you know, your job or your, your reputation. If you're coming from a place of love, if you're coming from a place of light, that is so grounding and that is so empowering and it gives you the confidence to face anything. And when you're coming from that place, the world, the divine, the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, is there to protect you, is there to guide you because you're in service, because you're standing up for what you believe in. And that takes faith. And that's how I think about it. And I wanted to share that with you guys because I really enjoyed that conversation with my friend the other day when she said, you know, I just, I just be the light and I'm there to help. And I was like, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I love that. I love that. So um, I'll share a little bit about my experience with uh, the season premiere of Heartland and transitioning myself off the show from playing the character of Ty for 14 years. It was a beautiful experience for me. I remember going to bed that night before the premiere and thinking like, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen, but I have, I have hope that, that people will understand. And I had a lot of support and a lot of understanding from people saying, we wish you well and thank you so much for, for playing the character for 14 years. And I'm so grateful for that. And I'm so grateful for all the supporters over the 14 years of the show that I was on it. It's, it's just it's very beautiful, and I'm very grateful for you guys. So thank you so much. It was a wonderful chapter in my life, and I love telling stories. I love creating experiences for people and just doing everything I can to share my passion with the world. And, and playing Ty Borden for 14 years was really cool. It was really fun, and I learned a lot. I learned so much, and I'm so grateful for it. And um, I'm really happy that the show is continuing to tell great stories and, and evolving, and, and people are still able to enjoy it. But yeah, so, so that's, that's a little bit about my, um, my experience with my departure from the show. And, you know, people have asked me if I'm going to continue acting, if there's more projects coming up. And I got to be honest, I'm taking a break. I'm going to take a break from acting and just focus on my podcast, focus on some other projects that I got on the go, my writing, my book. Acting has been fun for me and I've really enjoyed it. But I think it's important for me to take a break. I've learned a lot and I'll probably share more about what I've learned in, in the process of playing a character on a television show for 14 years. But I did want to share just this little snippet of something and, and talk about it with you guys because I think it kind of speaks directly to why I'm taking a break. And it's a quote from Jim Carrey, one of my favorite actors. And he was in an interview and he said this, and I'm going to try and quote it from memory as best I can. He said, when you create yourself to make it, you're either going to have to take a chance on being loved or hated for who you really are or you're going to have to kill who you really are and fall into your grave grasping onto a character that you never were. And when I saw that interview and I saw him say that, it really connected with me. And it connected with me on many levels. But I think it's important to share because I think it's relevant to many people, not just actors, but in general, in life, when we create ourselves, when we think we're supposed to be a certain way 
to survive, to make it, to be liked, to get the job. There are these ideas, these narratives, these images, these ways of being that we take on because we think we need to. To survive, to be liked, to be loved. And at some point, we have to either let go of what we think we should be and take a chance on being loved and hated for who we really are. Loved or hated, I should say. <laughs> loved or hated for who you really are. Or we're going to have to let go completely. And as Jim Carrey says, kill who you really are. And then you fall into your grave. You live the rest of your life just grasping onto something that you never were. And you're always chasing that. That's something to me that I'm like, oh man, that is so true on so many levels. In my own life, I had to look at myself and go, in what ways have I created myself to make it and abandon my real self? And I don't want to live the rest of my life chasing that, trying to be something I'm not. It was important for me to take a step back and go, you know what? I got to follow my heart. I got to listen to my heart. And I can't ignore what my heart is telling me right now. Because if I do, it's going to be, I, I just, like Jim Carrey said, it's going to spend the rest of your life chasing something that you never were. And a lot of people have asked me, you know, why'd you leave the show? Why'd you, why'd you quit? Why, why, why'd Ty have to die? Three different questions. But I'll answer for me, why did I decide to leave the show? And like I said in my interview, it's, I felt it in my heart. It was time to go. And I needed to honor that because if I didn't honor that, I wouldn't be honoring myself and I'd be chasing something that I think I need to be for the approval of others. And I needed to honor myself and take a chance at being loved or hated for who I really am for honoring myself and going my own way. And I'd rather do that than go the other way, which is abandon myself, abandon my heart and what I'm feeling called to do because I don't want to upset other people or I think this is what I should do or who I should be. And I think that's really important because so many uh, people in the world, they, they take on a role, not an acting role, but a role in life, you know, and that's just who they are and they can't break free from that. They've, they've taken it on so seriously, so, so in, entirely that they've abandoned themselves we all have roles that we play, but if we aren't at the same time honoring ourselves and honoring our own growth and listening to our hearts, that can create a lot of problems in the roles that we play. And I think it's important to find a healthy balance where we're not abandoning the responsibility of the roles that we have in our lives. We're still owning that responsibility, but at the same time, we're honoring ourselves because as we take care of ourselves, I believe, that allows us to give our very best in those roles and those relationships that we have in our lives. So I wanted to share that with you guys because it was something that ties into all of this and, and connects with my departure from the show and the, the stage of life that I'm at and what I'm learning and, and how I'm looking at my life now. Coming from that place of listening to my heart, trusting, having a vision, surrendering to the divine plan, God's plan, fulfilling my responsibilities, and honoring my heart at the same time and, and just allowing myself to, to move into that space. And it's uncomfortable <laughs> and it's unknown and it's like, what's next? And, and that requires faith and that requires courage. And I think those are very, very important things in our world today. So let's jump over to some questions from the Cameo peoples. So we got uh, a bunch of questions here. First one up, we got Annette. She's from the fan club, the Cameo fan club. And Annette says, do you believe in an afterlife? Thank you for the question, Annette. Yeah, I do. But I think, like I explained in a couple of my podcasts there when I, when I shared with you guys about my experience in the float tank where I left my body and I wasn't me anymore. Graham was gone. The way I would put it is that I became like a cosmic love, but it wasn't Graham that became that. It was like I left Graham behind and I rejoined the source or whatever you want to call it. I think the afterlife or the after experience or what comes after is probably similar. There's a, there's, it can't be just be over. <laughs> it can't just be over. I think it's going to be like waking up from like a dream. 
is going to be like, you wake up and you're like, whoa, whoa, that was crazy. I talked about this with uh, Cindy Busby on her, on her episode where I said, what if this body, this life was like a really advanced, like VR virtual reality headset. And, you know, we just don't know how to take it off. Like we've, we've put ourselves, our consciousness, our, our soul into this world, into this experience and this body that we have. And then when we die, we release from that body, we release from this experience, we go back to this spirit state or this ethereal state. And so that's kind of what I think the afterlife would be like, but who knows? We'll, we'll all find out eventually. Annette, thank you for that question. We got a question from Ashley, who is a part of the Very Inspired People, the VIP group. She asked me what my favorite hiking spot in Vancouver is. And I would say uh, Lynn Valley. There's some great hikes up in North Vancouver in Lynn Valley. So that's where I love to go hiking. Susie uh, is a VIP as well. And she asks for another reading from my book. Oh, okay. I can do that for you, Susie. Uh, let's read page eight from my book. And it goes like this. The wind is calm. The air is soft. The sun is setting and the ground is warm. Beams of light trickling through blades of innocent grass. The storm forgotten. The rain lost. There is no end nor a beginning. All that counts is the present. The hands are frozen as the warmth grows. So long has been the wait. So much has hardened. Turned away and sheltered. Protected from within. All this to be forgotten. Then to be reborn like the sand after a raging battle on the beach, divided and torn apart, then to be embraced with a gentle wave, washing clean the coarse and disordered sand, giving thus a new life, a new hope, with no means and no knowledge, coming closer like a gentle breeze, flowing movements, but at a rhythmic pace. The feeling grows like an outstretched hand, longing for revival, longing for forgiveness. Pain and hardship left behind. The day has come. The time is near. The final piece in an endless puzzle. Together for all, lost for none. Thank you, Susie. I appreciate uh, you asking me to read another poem from my book. That's great. Lori from my VIP group asks, How does the mapping out of episodes go? How does the flow go once a guest is there? And how much editing? Uh, great question, Lori. Thank you so much for that. The mapping out of episodes is just, when I have a guest, I do some research on them and I just kind of tune in and do a little meditation. I go like, what would be really exciting or really great to share with the world and to, how do I bring out the best from this person and how do I share that with the world? So I'll do some research, get some notes and then have some questions arranged. And then in the conversation, I just do my best to kind of connect and cultivate that fun. You know, I think that's really what we all want to do is we want to have fun and enjoy ourselves. And so that's kind of my focus is to try and have fun with that person and see how, how I can highlight as much of their beauty and wonder and awe and like uniqueness as I can. So, you know, I'll reflect on the questions if I, if I need to, but I, I have, I do all my homework and then I try and just go with the flow and have fun with it and just kind of explore that conversation. And with my solo casts, I, I got about 10 pages of notes here and <laughs> I write a bunch of stuff down and then, and then I just go with the flow. I'm like, man, I don't want to talk about that. Or I'll just talk about these things or this feels really good. I'm just going to go with this. So it's a, it's a combination of doing my homework and then being in tune and just going with the flow. The editing process is just me taking out the ums, the pauses, or, you know, if I have water here beside me that I will drink. And I'll cut stuff out like that because I, I just want to keep the thing moving and tight. So some episodes I can edit much quicker. Other episodes, I have lots of editing. So sometimes it's a couple hours. Sometimes it's more like eight hours. So that's that's the editing process. But I have some software that, that's really helpful for that. It basically translates or, or, or transcribes, I should say, all audio into a text document. And then I edit the text document like a Word document. And then as I remove words or, or move things around it moves the audio around. So it's a great application. It's called Descript. And I've been using that now for a little bit and it's great. Talia from my VIP group says, what was it like to produce an audiobook? What kind of movies do you like? 
Hollywood or more reflective? Thank you, Talia, for that question. Uh, producing an audiobook was fun. It was very different. So I'm really enjoying audio, and I'm really enjoying just focusing on the sound and the experience that people have with sound. When I was a kid, I listened to a lot of books on tape and audio adventures. There was a program called Adventures in Odyssey, and I listened to that all the time. We didn't have a TV when I was for most of my childhood. We did when I was really young, but then my mom asked my dad to get rid of it. And so we would just listen to Adventures in Odyssey and music and, and stuff like that. So it was a lot of audio. And what I loved about that was my imagination would just go. And I loved creating images in my mind and seeing the characters and everything happen. And um, creating an audiobook for Lynette, or as we call it, an audio journey, was great because it brought me back to that audio experience only. And I loved it. I thought this is, this is so much fun. So that's also something that I'm looking forward to in the future, possibly doing for for creative projects is creating audio journeys or stories like narratives for people because I'm a little screen fatigued. I don't know about you guys, but all this like, you know, zoom meetings and virtual workout stuff. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm so done with it. <laughs> so I, that's something I'm looking into right now is creating some audio narrative story experiences for people so that they can either sit back, close their eyes and imagine, or they can go for a walk and listen and, and just uh, enjoy life, and they don't have to be staring at their phone or a TV anymore. Uh, what kind of movies do I like? I do like Hollywood movies, and I do like more reflective movies. I like both. So to me, a, a good film is all about the spiritual journey of the character. If I am introduced to the character at the beginning, and then at the end of the show, or the end of the movie, or whatever, they have grown, they have evolved, they have overcome a fear, they have faced that, and they've grown from it, that's all I need. But if the movie, the TV show, the whatever, if there's no spiritual growth, then I'm not really interested. Because <laughs> to me, that's like the nutrition and the food. It's like, sure, you can like have a bunch of explosions and, and uh, flashy stuff. But if there isn't an evolution of the characters, it's kind of like dessert. I don't want to eat dessert all the time. You know, it's like there's, I, I can't get any nutritional content from that. And so every once in a while, like a movie like uh, what's that Will Smith and Martin Lawrence and bad boys with directed by Michael Bay. Like that's, that's pretty Hollywood. <laughs> there's, there's no, there's not a lot of spiritual evolution in that movie. It was just a lot of fun, a lot of explosions and cars being driven all over the place. And, <laughs> and every once in a while, those movies are fun, but, um, it's kind of like dessert, you know, like every once in a while, but I, I like to, uh, consume content. Like I consume food, like to nourish me and to, inspire me. Val Delise from my VIP group. Sorry, Val Delise, if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. I'm doing my best. I, I think it's pronounced Val Delise. You asked me, how do I deal with people's criticism, judgments about my decision or changes? Well, I touched on that a bit earlier, but effectively, if I'm coming from my heart and if I'm standing in that place of love and of light and I'm following what I feel called to do, criticisms, judgments, name calling, all those types of things, it doesn't really bother me because once you have that courage to speak up and to honor yourself and to follow your heart, that's like the hardest part. And then when, when you start getting like people throwing stuff at you or whatever or judging you, you quickly realize that it's really less about you and it's more about them on their journey. They're just, you know, maybe it's triggered something in them or they don't agree and and that's fine, you know. I get a real sense of calm and confidence just from honoring myself. I think it would be much harder if I was doing, making decisions or acting in ways where I wasn't honoring myself and I was getting all that feedback, all that criticism, all that, that uh, judgment. Uh, that would be very hard to, to handle <laughs> because if I'm not honoring myself and I'm just trying to please others and I'm getting all this negative feedback, it'd be very difficult to stomach that. So my, my response effectively is, be honest with yourself and the rest is easy, which is the first line in the last page of my book, one of my poems that I wrote. And effectively, it's true. It's once you take on that challenge of being honest with yourself and following your heart, being true to yourself, everything else is, is really easy because that is the hardest thing to do is just to honor yourself and be honest with accepting and, and honoring and being in tune with who you are. When you come from that place, those, those judgments and those criticisms, they really kind of fall away. 
And then the people that are honest and, and have a legitimate sort of constructive criticism, you can tell, you can feel it. You're like, oh, this person actually cares about me and they actually want to give me a, their two cents. That's helpful sometimes, you know, to uh, get some feedback. Melinda from the VIP group says, thoughts on the, can't say this word, will you take it? And I will just say the, the word that I can't say, I don't want to say because uh, YouTube is very particular about uh, talking about this issue. <laughs> so I'm assuming, I'm assuming you guys can uh, guess what it is because it's a, a relevant treatment to the situation that we're in right now where it's being suggested that you get two of these and then life can go back to normal. So Melinda, this is a good question and I can't really say too much about it on the podcast a, because Google and a lot of these major platforms are very particular about what you can say and what you can't say. So what I, what I will share is that you can probably guess because I'm not saying it. But I also want to say that I do not expect anyone <laughs> to make a choice solely or in any way influenced by my decision. I always want people to honor their heart, to honor what they feel is best for them. I encourage everyone to do that, to do your research and to dig in in both sides, you know, look at the research that is presented more easily, more readily, more all over the place, all over the news and such. Look at that stuff, look at those experts and then do some homework and see if you can find people that don't agree and see if you can find some research on that side and see if you can understand why people are, are not going to participate in this and just really take in both sides and my approach this always is don't jump to conclusions. It's so easy to jump to a conclusion and make up your mind really quickly. And what I always try and do is ask questions, dig in deep, try and find people that are, are passionate about this or connected to this and have experience, listen to what they have to say, and then listen to what other people have to say and how they refute that or how they, how they think about those things. What I have found for myself is that very often I make up my mind too quickly. <laughs> I want to believe one thing. And so I just go with that. And I don't bother to look at the other side of the argument. And so over time, I have found it's very beneficial to explore both sides and not explore at surface level. I'm not saying you just go to the, the other news network, so to speak, and just, you know, that's your research. I'm saying like, go actually find people, doctors or scientists or researchers on both sides and and see what they have to say, and then feel what resonates with you. I think that's important, and I believe in freedom of choice. I don't think anybody should just do something because everybody else is doing it, or your government tells you you should do it, or even your doctor. I mean, how many times, how many stories are there of people going to see their doctor, and their doctor says, you got cancer, and you got four weeks to live, and then the person says, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going along with that, and they go and seek alternative treatment, or they go and seek another way of, of looking at their life. And they turn their life around or they, they have miraculous miracle healings. There's, there's so many stories like that. And, and even stories where doctors misdiagnose. You know, they think that the, the patient, this is a sad story, but I've heard about stories like this where, you know, the doctor says, you got cancer. The patient says, oh, well, like, oh my God, how bad is it? And the doctor says, well, you probably got about a month to two months to live at the most. And then two months later, the person dies they do the autopsy. They didn't have cancer. They don't know what killed them. And there's documented stories like this where people believe they're going to die and they die. I remember when I learned about that and I was like, what? Like, how does that even happen? Well, it's the reverse of the placebo effect. So the placebo is you believe you're going to get better and they give you a sugar pill and your body creates what you need <laughs> and you get better. It, the placebo... Dr. Joe Dispenza wrote a book about this. The placebo is the most fascinating phenomena that I can think of right now when we're in this conversation because it is like your body can heal you through your belief. Like, how is that even possible? Like that, but it is. It's so amazing. So, you know, when it comes to trusting and and figuring out how do you discern all this information, how do you know what's right? It it really is for me. And this is my approach. Listen to everybody's side. Get, get all the facts. Get as much information as you can. Then take a step back. Go for a walk. Let yourself just relax and tune in and go, what feels right for me? Come from that place of groundedness as opposed to coming from a place of fear or uh, scarcity or you know being scared. Those decisions that come from that place, 
I have yet to, <laughs> I have yet to make a decision from that place. I'm like, thank God I was scared. <laughs> and I made that decision. It's never worked that way. So that's what I would say. And, uh, always tune in whether, you know, even if you're talking with your doctor, just tune in. Maybe you do trust them. Maybe you do have a good feeling about that. Then great. Go with that. Maybe your doctor or someone health professional is telling you something and you're like, I just, I just doesn't feel right for me. Like I, I gotta go this way. Then honor that. That's what I'm about. Honoring yourself and listening to your own internal guidance. We got Glenda. Glenda says, was it hard to separate who Ty is while trying to find out who Graham is? What kept you grounded? Thank you, Glenda, for this question. And I touched a bit about this on this previously there. And yeah, it was tough in some moments that I had where you're playing a character for so long. And for me, I really want to do a good job. I really, really wanted to do a good job. And I really wanted to put everything I could into the character. Sometimes when you invest so much energy into one thing, it's like what I was talking about the roles that we play, we kind of lose sense of, we lose track of who we really are. And in the acting world, you know, your job is literally to <laughs> act, to become somebody else, to be in that persona, that, that character and, and live through that character. So, you know, you go to acting classes and they talk about how to get into the role and stuff like this. And uh, there's no acting class that tells you how to step out of that role and how to come back to yourself and how to make sure that you don't get lost in those roles and, and create confusion in those, in that work. So I learned a lot about that and, and how it's important to take time and invest in yourself and, and um, be very clear about that. Because if you don't, it really creates a lot of problems in your own personal life. So was it hard to separate tight? Yes, at times it was. I worked very hard to do that because I enjoyed playing the character and it was a lot of fun and it was my first big show. So I, I wanted to put everything I could into it. But at the end of the day, like I said, it's important to not lose touch with who you are, regardless of the roles that you play in your life, to be in tune with your heart and to be in tune with yourself and to be honoring that authentic expression. And uh, if you're not doing that, it can make the roles that you play very, very difficult. And you can't really do your best work if you're not coming from that full place, from that grounded place. So what kept me grounded? Meditation, doing a lot of personal work, uh, reading books and asking deeper questions and just having conversations with people, uh, remembering that we're all going to die. <laughs> and what's this really about? You know, what am I really here for? You know, just kind of asking myself these, these deeper questions kept me grounded and connected to what mattered. I appreciate uh, everybody who asked me a question. I'll continue to answer questions from people. I'll probably do more Instagram lives and stuff like that. Cause I think people enjoy that kind of stuff. And having questions on the podcast is fun too. So thank you so much for all that. Thanks guys for joining me on my second solo cast. I got a couple podcasts coming out very soon. So stay tuned for that. I love you all so much. I appreciate you guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I wish you love, strength, courage, faith, vision, and uh, that real love for life that is so important to stay connected to that passion. And then that juice that is all around us all the time. But so often we, <laughs> myself, I'm speaking for myself here. So often I get disconnected from, and if we can reconnect to that, enjoy life and remember what it's like to be alive and to be in this world and just to make the most of it. That's what I wish for all of you. And I wish for myself. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.